Hello everyone, my name is Dr. J.P. Lindstroth. Uh, I want to thank Patricia Trejo and Brian Knowles for inviting me to speak at the 8th Annual Hispanic and Latino Studies Summer Institute for the Palm Beach County School District. Just to give you a brief biography about myself, I'm a social science teacher at Royal Palm Beach High School. I teach advanced placement, world history, honors world history and world history. I've also taught um, ACE US history. And um, I have a PhD from the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom, PhD in social and cultural anthropology. Um, I have been invited here today to speak about the social strategies that the urban Amerindians I studied in Brazil use to overcome racism and how that may apply to multicultural education here in the United States and in relation to theories of multicultural education as promoted by James Banks. Uh, I have been in teaching and education, primarily in higher education for the past 23 years. I am fluent in both Spanish and Portuguese. And in 2009, I was awarded a Fulbright Foreign Scholar Scholarship uh, to be a visiting professor at the Universidade Federal do Amazonas, or UFAM, where I also conducted an anthropological field study on different urban Amerindian populations, namely the Apurina, Cambeba, Kokama, Munduruku, Mura, Satare Mawe, Chukuna, and Tucano Indians. The city of Manaus, where I was a visiting professor and conducted my anthropological field research, is a city of more than two million people in the middle of the Brazilian Amazon. Um, at the moment, I'm also working on and writing my fourth book, uh, Crises Beyond Nationalities, Racism, Immigration, Genocide, and Peace. And um, so that's a little bit about myself. When, and thinking about um, the issue of racism in regard to the indigenous people I studied, have to really put it into context with Brazilian society. And understanding the how Brazilians understand ethnicity, which is very different than as the concept is understood in the United States. Manaus is a city of, of predominantly people with indigenous heritage, and even um, mixed heritage, what Brazilians call misturados, who have uh, indigenous heritage along with Caucasian heritage. Another ethnic term that we don't use in the United States, which they use is known as caboclo, which is somebody of indigenous descent and Caucasian dis uh, heritage. The majority of, pop of the population would consider themselves to be white or brancos. Um, however, after more careful consideration, realize that the majority of the population is actually have indigenous descent. So why are they negating their Native American heritage? And the reason is because that um, people in Brazil um, regard Indians or native peoples, Amerindians, as kind of the lowest 
class of ethnicity in the country. Indians are truly a minority in Brazil. Um, there's only roughly about a million indigenous people in Brazil, or 0.3% of the population. And um, in Manaus, the city of over 2 million people, there are approximately 50,000 or more uh, urban Amerindians living in the city. So when we think about um, this notion of uh, multicultural education as promoted by um, James Banks, um, multicultural education, an idea or concept, um, an education um, reform movement and a process is what he calls multicultural education. And also promoting the idea, according to him, that all students should have an equal opportunity to learn in school. The Brazilian native peoples that I studied in Brazil, um, their children were stigmatized in the school system. So the urban Amerindian peoples had to figure out a way uh, to um, make certain that their children were not discriminated against. Um, and so this talk, this um, lecture, if you will, um, is to explain those strategies that they used to overcome the racism that they faced by the larger society. I should also say that um, the native peoples um, in Brazil, um, the, at least the urban Amerindians that I work with and, and, and engaged with in Manaus, um, especially the Satare Mawe people, um, the week before I arrived, uh, their schoolhouse in the community where they lived was burned down by neighbors as an act of um, discrimination and racism against them because they did not want native peoples, Indians, in their neighborhood. So going back to James Banks, James Banks states that multicultural education focuses on how race, ethnicity, class, gender, religion, language, um, and sexual orientation, whether lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender identity, or what's called LGBT identity, um, influence student learning and behavior and how we as educators can and may incorporate an understanding of um, ethnicity and a better understanding of uh, ethnicity and race and how we, how we incorporate those varying views into edu the educational process of what's con considered multicultural education. I should also state, or also say, that um, back in 2005, when I was a professor at Nova Southeastern University, I was co-awarded, along with university colleagues, other university colleagues, a Alexander von Humboldt grant to study uh, ethnic minorities here in South Florida, namely Cuban Americans, Haitian Americans, and Guatemala Mayan Americans, Guatemalan Mayan immigrants. And that resulted in varying uh, articles co-written with um, colleagues, university colleagues, as well as graduate students. It also resulted in my own article of called Mayan Cognition.
Hello, everybody. Uh, just continuing from what I was saying before. Um, I was co-awarded along with colleagues and Alexander von Humboldt Grant to study Haitians, um, Cuban Americans, Haitian Americans, and Guatemala Mayan Americans immigrants um, in South Florida. And it resulted in um, various publications, including a publication of my own um, uh, in the Anthropology Journal History and Anthropology. The title of the article is Mayan Cognition, Memory, and Trauma. And the reason why I wanted to bring up that research today is because it applies to um, not only the native peoples that I studied in Brazil, but also an understanding of um, discrimination and racism in relation to uh, having a, a better understanding of multicultural education. And I just wanted to um, touch upon the brief theoretical uh, aspects of that article. Um, part of the article was um, analyzing the controversy of the Nobel laureate, uh, Rigoberta Mechutum. Some of the Guatemala Mayan immigrants who arrived in South Florida in Palm Beach County, uh, at least the earliest immigrants, um, were survivors of a genocide in Guatemala that happened in the early 1980s, 1980-1982, um, a genocide that mostly targeted uh, Mayan Indians in the highlands of Guatemala. Uh, a genocide that has been described as mostly um, from the violent actions of the Guatemalan military against these groups where 200,000 people were killed or just disappeared. Um, in, the, in my article, Mayan Cognition, Memory, and Trauma in the Journal of History and Anthropology, I discuss an anthropological controversy over the Nobel laureate Rigoberta Menchutum. She won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1992 for her work uh, with the Mayan Indians in her country, home country of Brazil. And she wrote an autobiography which has been really important in multicultural education. The autobiography, which is taught at many high schools and in many universities, I, Rigoberto Menchu, an Indian woman in Guatemala, first published um, in 1983 in France, and later um, the English translation in 1984. And it was the recollection of her life that another anthropologist questioned whether or not um, the memories that she expressed in her autobiography were true or were exaggerated. And that's an important point because I think it's an important point about uh, notions of memory, how memory is constructed, how memory may be constructed from uh, an ethnic and cultural point of view. And so anthropologists, uh, who were discussing this controversy about the veracity of Menchu Tum and her autobiography, um, talked about how indigenous memory, indigenous memory construction is quite different than we have in the West, in Western Europe, for example. And indigenous memory um, in many ways can be collective memory, how a village remembers the genocide in Guatemala, for example. And what does that mean as far as um, genocidal memory is concerned or reconstructing the atrocities that were in fact committed in Guatemala in the early 1980s, 1980, 1982. The Civil War in Guatemala lasting really from the 1960s until 1996. 
And so in the article, My Incognition, Memory, and Trauma, my article, um, I talked about this idea of exaggeration. The idea that, well, uh, memories of genocide may have been exaggerated or maybe the facts weren't altogether true. As a colleague who we talked about uh, her work, uh, who's written on the Holocaust, um, even if the memories were partially true, doesn't make them any less true. In other words, memories of genocide, if they're collective memories, of course they're not going to have maybe necessarily the details right. Um, but those memories of genocide um, are, def are collective memories. And what I found is that when I, um, back in 1990, back in 1990, when I um, collected depositions for people to get green cards to stay in the United States, there were definitely uh, exaggerated memories, memories of genocide um, that I translated into English. Many of the memories were the same, but the atrocities happened in many villages in northern Guatemala, in the highlands. And so even if we talk about even if memories are exaggerated, doesn't make them any less true. So that was part of the article. And then the art other aspect of the article was talking about memories of racism, memories of discrimination. And the memories of racism and discrimination that the Guatemala Mayas experienced in South Florida. We know that the Maya, the Mayan, Mayan immigrants um, are Indians, native peoples in um, Guatemala from varying um, groups who speak, speak different native languages, whether it's Canjobal or Mam or Kichi or um, those, those groups um, are discriminated against by the Ladino or predominantly so-called white uh, Hispanic population in Guatemala. And the reason why I bring that up is because uh, my analysis, um, my theory in the article, my different theories, uh, led me to a cognitive understanding of racism and discrimination. And I think that's important to bring up today um, in this, my talk, in my lecture. There are two forms um, of memory and trauma that I pointed out. And this notion of memory and trauma is quite important in terms of not only in understanding memories of genocide, but also understanding memories of racism. And um, so what do I mean by that? Well, we can think of uh, memory in term, and trauma in terms of time. And we can think of time being divided into synchronic episodes or specific episodes in time when individuals remember certain and specific episodes of racist discrimination. And we think we can think of racism and trauma as occurring over long periods of time or what I call diachronic trauma. So an individual um, who has experienced racism can have both. They can have memories of specific times when they were discriminated against. And racism itself can be an occurrence over a long period of time, which leads to an understanding of um, structural violence. And by structural violence, um, also expanding upon the term as understood by uh, the anthropologist Nancy Shepard Hughes and the British, sorry, the French sociologist and anthropologist Pierre Bourdieu. So structural violence um, uh, consists of those oppressive structures in society which, so as I was discussing, um, 
understanding um, racism from my theoretical perspective um, as it related to trauma um, and memories of trauma, memories of racism, uh, can be analyzed in terms of time, whether we're talking about specific episodes or synchronic trauma, specific episodes of racism, or diachronic trauma, diachronic racism experienced over long periods of time. And an individual may have both. They may have synchronic memories, specific episodes, but they may experience racism for a long period of time. And so um, what I also want to relate to is this notion of structural violence. Structural violence, um, as I was, met, I was talking about, um, expanding upon the theoretical ideas of Nancy Shepard Hughes, an anthropologist at Berkeley, and the now late Pierre Bourdieu, who's a sociologist and anthropologist uh, from France, who was. Um, the idea of structural violence is that understanding how the structures uh, in society keep particular people from having a, a proper education, from having jobs, from having housing, because of their ethnicity or race or their uh, religious point of view or their religious views or maybe because of their sexual orientation. So what are the barriers and structures in society which um, are oppressive and keep people from let's say, having normal lives um, um, as in comparison to perhaps uh, Caucasian white majorities. And so that was part of the theoretical discussion in the article Mind Cognition and Trauma. In a, in a future book on my Fulbright research in Brazil, um, I'll be expanding upon these ideas of racism against the Amerindian peoples that I studied and I mentioned earlier. Um, so let's, let's return to um, James Banks's notions of um, multicultural education. And what I'd like to do is expand upon, or just discuss briefly, what he considers level three and level four of multicultural education. When he talks about level three, transformative curriculum, uh, and I'm gonna, you know, basically paraphrasing and, and quoting what he's saying, the structures of curriculum is changed to enable uh, students to view concepts issues, events, and themes from the perspective of a diverse ethnic and cultural groups. Whereas uh, uh, level four is what he considers social action. Students make decisions on important social issues and take actions to help solve um, you know, various themes. I think it's important too to um, bring up the French philosopher Michel Foucault and his notions of power knowledge. And the reason why Foucault is important is because the idea of knowledge equated with power uh, is very important to, I believe, uh, Banks' concepts of multicultural education and how power knowledge can transform students' lives um, by empowering them with the knowledge skills to uh, take ideas beyond the classroom, beyond the classroom and apply it to their everyday lives. So let me then um, briefly return to the urban Amerindian peoples I studied in Brazil, and specifically one of the groups um, 
the group uh, known as the, who call themselves Satare Mawe, Native Peoples. They, um, in their language, um, Mawe, which is a Tupi, like part of the Tupi family, um, the Satare Mawe is a conflation of two words in the Mawe language. One being fiery, fiery caterpillar, kind of the, of the poisonous caterpillar, caterpillars that they identified with, and also Mawe from a talkative parrot. And these are people that are originally from um, a, a southern area of Amazonas state in Brazil, in the Amazonia region. They are a people, um, as I mentioned, who speak the part of the Tupi language family. And um, they are one of the uh, larger indigenous groups in the Amazon, the Brazilian Amazonia. Um, young men in their society um, uh, go through what is um, considered a rite of passage ritual, rite de passage, as Van Ganep would call it. And what are rites of passage rituals? Well, those are the types of rituals, um, for example, circumcision rites that young men go through from transforming from adolescence into adulthood to becoming men. So the Satare Mawe people have a unique ritual, which is dancing in place and with other members of their uh, group, male, male society. Uh, and it's called the Tucandera dance. And what these young men do, they, they wear palm frond gloves with uh, approximately 100, 150 uh, bullet ants, Haraparnara clavata is the Latin, family of these ants, very large stinging ants, and on the stinging scale, some of the worst pain you can endure. But they dance with these stinging ants and are stung for a period of 15, 20 minutes uh, in order to become men in their society. And many um, indigenous peoples throughout the world have uh, rites of passage rituals. So the, the young men, adolescents, are expected to undergo this ritual uh, for at least 20 times in their lifetime to become men and to be eligible to marry within Satare Moe society. The group that I studied in Manaus, Brazil, um, were also Seventh-day Adventists, um, known as Adventista. Um, and so they had you know, they were, uh, Christian beliefs along with their traditional rituals. And what's important, the reason why I bring up their Tucadera dance, or just the Tucadera is actually the, the, in their language, the ant that I mentioned, the bullet ant or the Parapara or Kalata. Um, the reason why I bring that up is that they, on the day of the Indian, in, in Brazil they have a special day or day of the Indian, which is a holiday that's recognized throughout Brazil, April 24th. And um, what, on this day, um, native peoples and native peoples in Manaus, Brazil, uh, would dress up in their um, traditional Indian, uh, Indian uh, native attire, and they would paint themselves with um, black paint, or chenipapo, um, and the red paint known as urukum from these different um, uh, plants. Uh, and the children would go to school uh, with their native attire and at, at the beginning,